and then welcome to Remote Rehab's third webinar. Um, we're just going to wait a little while for people to get on board, but welcome. This is Through My Eyes and In My Shoes, and we're talking through the patient experience of remote rehabilitation. Hi, I'm Caro, and I'm really behind the scenes, and uh, I'm a co-founder as well, but sort of general dog's body, really. <laughs> So what I'd like you to be able to do is if you want to chat, if you can just chat through the chat window, uh, questions and answers go in the Q&A panel uh, and I'll be either answering them uh, as we go or we'll be handing over to Diana and Chris uh, towards the end of the webinar to answer questions. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to our website which is rrc.life and you're able to get far more information about what we're doing and look at our community and also if you join our newsletter you'll be able to get our Wednesday roundup with all the information that we've been doing through the week in the community and you might even want to join the community. So I'm going to hand you over to Christina now. Good evening. Hi, I'm Chris. So my background is I'm a talking therapist and I'm also a bit of a geek. I really do love talking to patients to find out about their own personal experience of their rehabilitation journey and their experiences of their healing journey. So what we're going to do tonight is we're going to do um, just want to share some of the things we've discovered. And we're going to share, first of all, what has to exist for patients to gain real and lasting benefits from tele-rehabilitation sessions. And that we've been talking to lots of patients about that very subject, what, it, what has to exist. The second thing we're gonna be exploring are the characteristics and the mindset of people who say, I absolutely find tele-rehabilitation really, really suits me. The third thing we're gonna be exploring is the criteria that patients use to evaluate the effectiveness of their tele-rehabilitation sessions. And then finally, we're gonna be having a look at what has to be in place for family members and carers to really embrace um, tele-rehabilitation. So we're gonna start, um, Liana, I know you're gonna give us a context, aren't you, as to um, where tele-rehabilitation, or as we call it, remote rehabilitation sits within a spectrum. Oh dear, one second. You need to do the... Um, there you go, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Our first technical hit of the evening, very sorry. Um, okay, so pre-COVID, we were rehabilitating our patients face-to-face. And there were very few teams who were able to offer a remote approach to therapy. In fact, it was probably a bit more in the private sector um, than in the NHS and across Europe and Australia. As we went through the pandemic, teams, especially community teams, neuro teams, stroke teams, were told to either stop rehabilitation or to find other ways. And a lot of teams embraced doing a remote approach. And that led them to really have to upskill in terms of how we provide remote assessment and remote rehabilitation in an effective way. As we're moving through into a new normal and trying to figure out how we move through with still having some restrictions on how we have our lives and provide our rehabilitation and do our work the offer of remote rehabilitation really allowed us to see the opportunities and benefits that it could provide and at this point we're now looking at providing what we would call a blended approach and that's really what we're we're trying to explore and experiment within our community and within our straight teams is how we do what needs to be done face to face, face to face, how we use remote rehabilitation effectively in one package of rehabilitation for our patients. 
And how do we use tele-rehab? So we can use tele-rehab for follow-up chat. So that could be a six month review, a six week review. Um, it can be just a checkup to see how the patient is, secondary prevention, that type of thing. We can also use it for demonstrations. So I use it a lot as a physiotherapist to demonstrate how to complete stretches for carer training because I really find that actually me being stepped back I have to really talk them through how to do it but then I'm able to see how they do it when we're really not there so demonstration is a way we can use it together so doing things together either exercises together training sessions together um, video um, clips of exercises together or we can send them things to do alone so when um, we're not there so that could be following a video clip or email of exercises etc and then we can also use it for group therapy so I know in my day-to-day -day job we're starting to set up remote groups that can look at things like cognition self-management upper limb groups lower limb groups I know the the guys um, at Queen Square are doing a lot of that already. So when I was thinking um, of how to really get, provide a quick and easy way for us to think about who's suitable for remote rehabilitation and who would benefit, I came up with the acronym REMOTE to really for us to think about how we would assess that. So going through these aspects. Is there, what are the risks? What are the, the expertise, the mindset, the opportunity, the targets and the effectiveness? And that can be both for the patient as well as the therapists involved. So if I go through the acronym, so the R for risk is around Okay, what are the physical risks? So I've been talking to a lot of my therapists, especially around balance and risk of falls, is how, how do you grade that? So it may be that you decide that you're going to stratify your patients into those who can do just chair-based exercises and tailor your rehabilitation around that, then what you would do for those who are standing and what you do for those that are dynamic and measure your risk accordingly. What's the emotional mental risk? So how mentally prepared are they? Do I know I've had conversations with patients where actually seeing themselves on the video for the first time is quite distressing. So is it that you they need to turn the video off to do some of the, the, the things or etc.? And just general health and safety. So uh, if you're going to do a kitchen remote assessment that they can assess, you know, the, the hot temperature of the kettle, for example. So all those things, when you're thinking about your session, what are the risks involved? What are the expertise? So what's the skill level of the patient and the family? And also what's your skill level? What's their background, their experience of um, any type of technology? or any type of rehabilitation like this, and their capability. So what things can have an impact on their ability to access remote therapy? One of the biggest ones is around mindset. And I know our webinar last week spoke about um, assessing capacity to change and your mindset to participate in remote rehabilitation is crucial. So what are your beliefs around and what are, the, what are the therapist and the patient's belief around remote rehabilitation? Can they focus? Can they flex and adapt? So um, I spoke a lot um, with some of my clients around how we transition between exercises. So how do all those things together, are we really ready to embark on this journey to, put, to have a look at remote rehabilitation? What's the opportunity? So what's possible? What can we um, really do together? And what will remote rehabilitation enable us to do? So I really like the idea of sending my clients videos after of the exercises that we've gone through in a session to really allow them to have some guided practice on their own. 
and their own time and their own space. So what is possible with that? And the opportunities in the environment. So what can we do? What is around the environment that we can use remotely that will help this? What are their goals? So do the goals relate to um, and offer themselves to remote working? What outcome measures can we use remotely? Or what parts of outcome measures we can use? So I know that we've used a lot of timed unsupported stand. I know um, speech therapists have done a lot of recording of their sessions. Um, so yeah, what, what are the patient's goals and what are their aspirations? And then the effectiveness. So again, what measures are you gonna use and what metrics are you gonna use? Once you've gone through this algorithm, you should have the opportunity to really have an idea whether the patient is suitable for remote rehabilitation moving forwards. Lovely, thank you. So, with that as a context, I would just like to introduce you to five patients. Now, these aren't their actual photographs because two of the patients didn't want to show their photos, so we didn't think it was fair to have sort of two mock-ups and then uh, three real photos. So we've used, um, I think, photos from Unsplashed, I think they are. Um, but what we've done is we've chosen photos that really reflect how we think those patients have come across to us. So we're going to introduce you to five. Um, so let's start uh, at the top with Tom. So Tom's 19 and um, he had his stroke um, as a result of a heart operation. So it came completely out of the blue. Um, he woke up from an operation expecting one thing and having two things that have really massively impacted his life. This stroke, his stroke has affected his mental health um, and it's affected his confidence. He was doing a job he absolutely loved. And I know, Liana, when we talked to him, he was so passionate about his job, wasn't he? He was just like, it was heartbreaking for him. Um, and I know that for, for Tom, he's still struggling to make sense of where he wants to go in his future. So whilst he's got some, um, what I would describe as sort of um, activity goals, the life purpose goals, where am I going to be in five years time and what do I want to be doing with my life? He's really struggling with. He's also struggling with concentration um, and being able to um, maintain eye contact and concentration when he's particularly when he's using the video so anything else you want to add Liana and I think with Tom it's just understanding that you know as his therapist one of his therapists I really thought he would lend himself to remote rehabilitation you know he's young he knows how to use technology he uses social media during sessions he was always on his phone so i thought you know that he would really embrace it but as we go in to talk about tom and his journey i think it will become aware that actually those preconceived ideas it really needs to be an individualized assessment because he he didn't find as enjoyable as as you may have thought yeah, and, and I was really surprised at that actually as well. So like, as with Liana, I think I made the, and you know, we all sort of talk about don't make assumptions. And I, I, le I leapt into this assumption that he was going to absolutely have loved it. And as we will talk about later, um, it couldn't be more different from that. So that's Tom. Then I'd like to introduce you to Tony. Now, Tony's had two strokes. Uh, the second stroke has left him in a wheelchair. Uh, Tony's background is he's used... Um, video conferencing in his previous life. He's, he's, done, um, he's done all sorts of work with video conferencing. So he's massively confident about A, using technology, um, and B, being really comfortable um, communicating via video and by the telephone. For Tony, his challenges are his physical challenges. So he's very committed to, to his um, uh, virtual rehab, loves all of that, but he actually, because he's, he's in a wheelchair, He's really, really struggling because he needs people to go in and visit him because he needs the physical support because he doesn't have, whilst he has a fantastic family network, he doesn't have his family members there with him. So much of the rehab that he wants to do, he needs that face to face. But we'll talk a little bit about how he is using uh, virtual rehab in, in a minute. 
Yeah, and I, I would agree. Sorry, Chris. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, is that again, again, it's about preconceived ideas because Tony would have been, um, it would have been said that he wasn't appropriate for a remote. So we'll just do face to face if that decision was made solely by the MDT. Okay, so we'll come back to Tony because Tony gave us some fantastic, wonderful examples of how we could use uh, remote. So I'm just going to introduce you to Hannah. Um, Hannah, I think we can safely say that Hannah doesn't really um, like people invading her home. So for Hannah, um, what was really interesting was she was really, really excited about doing remote rehab because it meant that nobody was going to come into her house and that everything that she was going to be able to do, she could do at a distance. Massively independent, very um, charismatic, uh, determined uh, young woman. Um, and, I, and I think the overriding message that we got from Hannah was um, bring it on. Just what else, what else can we do? How else can I do this? Because um, she really, really valued it, didn't she? I know she's your, she's your patient, so yeah. And she was one of the one of the first I I tried to do some remote rehabilitation with. And in terms, it was more around her upper limb. And I think there's with um, someone who doesn't like people <laughs> that much, um, having that rapport with her and building that can be difficult. So actually taking, me taking the time to really think about, and I had to be on my toes, so I couldn't come to the session not having a plan. That would be, that would be silly. Because <laughs> she'd, she'd have you right there. You need to know your plan, know your transitions, know what exercises, have backups, make sure your Wi-Fi is switched on because she's, she's on it. <laughs> and you've got to catch up with her really, which was really exciting for me. Okay, so Laura, she's somebody that I've been coaching um, since uh, lockdown. She had her stroke um, quite a while ago now, um, but she's still experiencing all sorts of emotional challenges as a result of her stroke. So whilst she's not having traditional rehab, she's having coaching to support um, her confidence um, uh, because she had a stroke while she was driving and that's had a massive impact as you can imagine on all sorts of aspects of Laura's life. Um, she, she, now she, again I was, I was expecting that she would take really readily to uh, video um, uh, because she comes from an IT background and um, she's got lots of experience of being a facilitator so I immediately let to this is going to be really straightforward and easy and it hasn't been at all. It's been a really interesting journey because Laura, um, she's also, um, she's, a, she's an energy healer. So she does all sorts of other things. And for her, being physically present with somebody was so important. And so she struggled with not having somebody present with her, but she's actually benefited enormously from groups. So she's very much part of a, a support group who do meet virtually. Um, so there's, there's quite an interesting contrast. The other thing that, that Laura is really challenged with is her eyesight, because she's, um, she's got a number of problems with her, her visual um, acuity. So she's, uh, we have to be very, very mindful that if we are going to be doing it, we have to turn it on and off, and we have to do all sorts of things to make her more comfortable. Yeah, and I think when you were talking to me about Laura, I think one of the things that striked me was your attitude chris to remote meant that you you kept trying it and that you didn't give up instantly which meant that laura found um the positivity or the aspects of it that she could use it for um and you took into consideration the bits that you needed to adapt to make it easier for her which i found helpful to me <laughs> Okay, and the last person, oh, is Meryl. Um, she's your patient again, uh, Leona. And um, I, I think the really amazing thing about Meryl is her determination. So um, it wouldn't have been her uh, therapy of choice by any stretch of the imagination at all. And it's been a really, um, it's been a really challenging journey for her. And she's needed a huge amount of support from carers and family. Um, to really get to a place where she can 
engage really effectively with um, video. Um, but she's made, she, her determination has been extraordinary. And um, I think her sort of parting comment to me was, well, it's better than seeing somebody in a mask. So she's, she's worked her socks off, I think, to, to really embrace it. And it's, I know it's also helped her family, hasn't it, Liana? Because basically she wasn't in touch with her family before learning how to use technology. And she is now, which has made a massive difference to her social isolation. And I think for my learning again, she was someone that potentially you wouldn't be your first choice to use remote with because of her balance issues. She had um, vestibular problems, so dizziness, um, and also at risk of falls. So where we were, she was shielding. So we had to figure it out quickly, but actually her husband was able to film her walking and we, he learned the exercises with her. There was a lot of support there and she embraced it. And in the end, we're having nice little catch ups where she's telling me what she's done well that week, what she hasn't. And then also a big amount of problem solving because we're not there going in there daily to see. It was actually, well, I, I had to really try this and um, this is what happened and we can talk it through. And she really embraced it and achieved her goals, which was, you know, a really positive experience for her, for both of us. Thank you. So let's just um, we'll flip to the next slide and just explore the topics that we covered with these patients. So these are um, the comments that these uh, five have made. But we're also when we come on to the summaries, we're going to pull in all sorts of other people's comments as well. Yeah. So we started, obviously, we did contextualise. So each of them told us about their stroke and they told us about their stroke journey. And then we moved on to their technology experience. And this is where it got really interesting, didn't it? So from Meryl, zero, absolutely nothing mm -hmm. to who we imagined was going to be the most tech savvy, which was Tom. And it turned out to be quite a different kettle of fish. So I don't know whether you want to, Liana, just start taking us through a little bit about Meryl's journey. I think um, we took a, a bit of time to get her up to speed. So involving kind of on what I call as onboarding. I don't know where I got that term from, but that experience of getting from the talking through the steps of how to get to that point where we both go, ta-da, we can see each other. <laughs> on a on a call and it's you've done it that was really positive but from that experience you get to have a lot of conversations build a rapport no you know I'm quite all right with technology I didn't show that at the beginning of the webinar but I am <laughs> and I think um we were able to learn together um how to use different platforms and then by the end, once you've done it once and you've done it twice and three times, you build up your competence and then it becomes easy. Um, and especially um, being able to provide emails and um, really think about sending exercises different ways and being a bit quick and screen sharing and everything. She really appreciated that. So we, we tried lots of different things in the end, which was really helpful for her. Um, but in terms of Tom, I think I was really surprised to hear that actually he wanted things quite short, so short sessions where he was concentrated on one bite sized thing because actually his attention, he would get distracted if someone was in the room with him. So actually, I kind of assumed, and, and he wanted a plan for the session so that he knew how to transition. He wanted a lot more setup time, which I probably didn't give as much as you would to Meryl, because I can't, you kind of would just say, here's the stuff. This is how you log on. You know how to log on, don't you? And then we'd, we'd make it work. But actually, he probably needed a bit more time and a bit more planning. Um, so it's really trying to have that individual approach to, to setting up the technology. And it was interesting when I interviewed him, because I interviewed him um, a couple of weeks ago just to really sort of explore this his whole technology experience and his whole sort of setup and he said you know whilst it, he was he was experienced before his stroke and i think one of the things that i didn't necessarily or we didn't necessarily really think about was was the impact that 
um, his stroke was going to have on his confidence to actually use technology. So whilst he's very physically able to use technology, um, his stroke has left him with, with all sorts of um, self-belief challenges um, that actually mean that he's quite reticent to use technology. Um, and also because of the concentration element, um, he just finds that it's, it's just way that sometimes can be very, very distracting. So let's talk about uh, Laura. So setup and technology. So um, the biggest challenge that I, we experienced with Laura was um, physically just watching the screen. So very similar challenges to Tom in the sense of the screen was was difficult to be um, focused on. But for Laura, it was it was all to do with her eyesight and how much um, time she could actually concentrate on the screen. And I think what Laura taught me particularly um, was Zoom fatigue. Um, that how long somebody can actually be on it. And what I learned from Laura really in the technology setup piece was that she was, she was working so hard to maintain eye contact, which she thought was really important in our relationship, that she was just becoming really exhausted. And the other thing that was difficult for her as well was that she was sort of in her mind, she was thinking when Chris says something, that's, you know, it's in time. Whereas of course there's the slight delay. And of course with all the delays and the various bits and bits that happen sometimes with internet connections, um, she was finding that also quite emotionally challenging. So we came to a situation where for the first couple of sessions, we really worked on the phone because it just made it more relaxed for her. And then slowly we could start to introduce video um, so that she could have the, the opportunity to see me and we could, we could do a few, a few things that she wanted to do um, by, by watching. Um, so I think, I think that was really interesting for me and I learned so much from her about this whole concept of Zoom fatigue and just when to switch the, um, when to switch the camera off, when to switch it back on and how long she could stay um, in that sort of um, virtual space. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I think I've had, in terms of vision, I probably have had some other experiences of actually being able to really look at someone's visual, um, like movements, their eye movements, and, and practice those exercises quite a lot easier over video because I can switch my video off and, and really get into the camera and look at their movements. And so from my experience with another um, patient of mine we found that really um, quite quite easy and 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 beneficial um, and and he liked it because he didn't need to he didn't need to leave his house we could just sit at the table and do that it's quite <laughs> it's quite simple lovely so Tony um, technology experience he was away basically he'd already um, used um, uh, video conferencing before I think his frustrations came with the internet connections, he got very frustrated if, a, if one of his therapists um, had a poor connection because he was ready to go um, and he was all sort of excited about that. And then of course the person wasn't able to connect. So he was finding that quite frustrating. So when we get onto the wave, the magic wand, he had lots and lots of advice for all of us about <laughs> how we could sort our internet connections out and where we should be and how we should be. Um, for, for Tony, I think the setting up was simple. Um, the difficulty, I think, for him was if, and we'll come on to the assessment in a minute. So the actual initial part was really straightforward. Do you want to say anything about Tony, Liana? No, no? okay. <laughs> so, yeah. okay, so uh, Hannah. Um, now, Hannah, um, she she again I think she was very ready and up for it wasn't she 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 was very quick to set everything up um and I think for her she wanted it very much her way didn't she and she's she's got support um so she she was very clear how she wanted everything to, to work and she's been like that I think ever since isn't she she knows where she wants to put the camera she knows where she wants to put the equipment she's in charge absolutely and that makes it easier for me <laughs> i think as well what we've done with hannah is use a lot of innovative stuff that with the 
the presence of COVID has allowed us to do. So she was able to share her screen with videos of her when she's achieved her goal. So one of the videos that she shared was around her ability to finally bring the cup to her mouth. This is months of therapy. And whereas, you know, we could then watch it over and over and relive it and actually analyze. So those, those videos and then their kind of outcome measures in themselves. Um, so whereas she's not necessarily sending it to me, which is a, a bit of a barrier when it comes to um, remote rehabilitation at the minute, I think information governance wise, we still haven't gotten over that hurdle unless someone in the chat can say how they're doing that um, but she was able to share the video with me in the session and then we could actually work with that so and there's more there's that's not where it should stop there's more stuff that we can can do as her goals progress and it's interesting when we come on to wave a magic wand i think those were the, one of the things that she talked about wasn't she we need to get more tech savvy and we need to have more storage and all sorts of things because there's all this stuff you could do and um, she's a little bit frustrated, I think, that um, she can't, we can't use technology to the full that she believes we would be able to. Um, OK, so let's go on to um, assessment. Um, I, I think for all of them, um, the assessment process was relatively straightforward. Um, it, it got a little bit hiccupy, I think, for some people when it was about um, them having to film themselves doing something. And if they were having to demonstrate that they could do something. So for um, the majority of them, I think, apart from, I think, I think Hannah, who was on it, um, and she was, I think she had an army of a film crew, I'm sure she was sort of getting everybody involved. Um, the guys found that sort of, um, and I suppose also had, um, uh, Laura, because she didn't need to, to film herself. So that was quite straightforward. Um, but for Tom, I think the assessment process he found quite challenging because he found um, filming himself, knowing how to film himself, how to set the camera up, um, where, to, where to position the camera, um, was quite challenging for him, wasn't it? And he talked quite a lot about that. However, what he appreciated and was quite comfortable with was the conversational aspect of assessment. Yeah. And, you know, personality-wise, he's quite laid back. So you would assume that he potentially wouldn't need a lot of time planning a session like you could just you he wouldn't be like Hannah that would be on your back if you hadn't got things together you know correctly in the session but actually he he wanted it to be really smooth and for you to take for us to take some time to think okay if we're doing this exercise this is where you need to put the camera and if we're doing this type of exercise this is where we need to take put the camera so that he doesn't have to add more co cognitive load to the session in thinking placing planning it was just this this is what we're going to do and i think with tom and hannah because of their upper limb deficits so they they had moderate to severe upper limb deficits trying to negotiate where to put things with one hand can be tricky um so we really need to probably take a bit more time with that um assessment uh, planning for the assessment side of things and i think hannah made a really good point actually when I talked to her a few weeks ago um, she was saying actually it's a great thing to incorporate into your whole overarching therapy so actually even thinking about you know how to move the camera where to place the camera how to do things is all part and parcel of therapy so she very much embraced it as interestingly did Tony who just said well actually this is I, I've experienced it as part of the therapy mm. um, and I think that the more that you can incorporate something into we're doing this and this is what you're going to gain from it and this is how it's going to support you the more that people buy into it and the, and the easier people find it um so i'll come back to tony in a minute but uh, just to get to to carry on with with um just, just quickly touch on uh, laura um i think laura's was quite straightforward because hers was a talking therapy so as i've said to you before the whole assessment piece we did via the phone and then we moved very slowly on to as we started to do more of the sessions. Um, so we then started to introduce um, the idea of the video and how we could sort of share things um, via video. We also set up a Dropbox um, so we could um, put information in there together and share things. Um, and we also used the Dropbox for her to, um, when she was doing some, some work, she wanted to film some things. 
Um, so she basically put that into the Dropbox as well. So we set up a number of sort of uh, sharing things that we could use um, so that she and I could stay in, com in, in contact. We also set up um, a WhatsApp um, uh, connection and we also agreed that when she hit particular challenges that she'd um, and, and overcame particular challenges, she'd let me know via WhatsApp. And I know that some, some therapists have been using that uh, really successfully. Yeah. So let's uh, come back to Tony. And um, so for Tony, the assessment process, as I said, was very straightforward. Um, the challenge that he's experienced comes really when it comes to the treatment plan. Um, so for him, he really likes conversations. He likes um, having his review sessions via video. He really likes to um, use that. And he also likes to use his video um, to watch what the therapists are doing. So he likes that it's for demonstrations. It becomes more difficult for him when he's actually filming himself um, because he doesn't have the support structure at home to actually enable that to, to work effectively for him. And I think that's where you, you would definitely be thinking of the blended approach. So the things that you definitely need to do face to face, there's no other way. And I think um, it's interesting because we, we are at some point going to look a bit into spasticity management and how, how you would do that. And I think for Hannah and, um, and Tom, there was an element of, I just, we do have to go in to have a feel of, of that or have a look at that. But then the bits that we can do remotely, we definitely will do. And it's just as good. Um, but the bits that we have to go in and physically um, do some manual handling with or uh, speech therapy, or whatever it is, then we definitely will do that. And lastly, uh, Meryl, her <laughs> assessment. I mean, you know, that was easy. <laughs> she she um, would let you know what you want. So we used things like the dizziness handicap inventory, which is a subjective measure of dizziness to be able to give her a score as well. So it fits the outcome measures um, model of, of treatment, but also then get a lot more about how it's aff affecting her and the investigation behind when exactly do you get dizzy? What is it? You know, I'm not physically in the session trying to elicit this dizziness. She has to then tell me. It then allowed me to, because she was saying that um, she felt like she was falling forwards when she was walking. So then it was like, okay, I need to see you walk now. <laughs> so how can we do that? Um, and then her husband got the camera and filmed her so it was it's it's what you want to be able to do isn't it as a therapist you want to be able to step back and have a look um and that was really interesting then I was able to to diagnose what exercise she needed I said to her you know because there's a lot of risk assessment with um balance and dizziness and actually I said to her, this is, this is a bit tricky. This might be a bit hairy scary. So I'm going to give you a bit of a checkup call in a, in a day or so to make sure you're okay with it. Um, and when she was fine. And then we moved on to the, the progression. So I think it actually allowed her to really problem solve with me and then move forward with her rehab independently and then go from there. So it was really good. So treatment plans. Well, as we said, um, there's an absolute uh, huge spectrum. Everything from um, really the um, the videos being used or just as a follow up. So it's just a, it's a conversational space where people could actually um, have a bit of a chat and a follow up, right the way through to patients filming themselves. I and mean, Han Hannah, um, I will never forget that the, she sent me because I, I, I literally just did it. I had a, an hour's chat with her and then she just sent me a whole load of uh, different films from all the things that she'd been achieving because she'd been actually keeping a record week by week of all the things that she'd been doing. Um, so that was really quite amazing. And she came up with lots and lots of different things to, to do um, in the session. So I think the treatment plans really were, were led, weren't they, by how much the patients actually wanted to do virtually um, and how much they wanted to do face-to-face. -face. Um, so if we go on that sort of spectrum, I think that you'd see, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but you'll see a real sort of difference between where Tom was and he got as far as demos and that was it, didn't want to go any further, whereas Hannah went right to the opposite end of the spectrum and she was 
absolutely engaged with it and um, as did Laura who's also been working with groups as well so it uh, my experience was that all they were all sort of talking about the particular things that suited them and the things that worked well for them yeah and I think it's dependent on their goals and aspirations um, and that really can guide where where you go with the remote rehabilitation and, and their experience of it mm. So what worked well and what didn't work for them? Um, I think what was interesting was they all spoke um, really fondly of their therapists and it was the therapist who made the difference that made the difference. So it was the therapist who was, was sort of, when the therapist was confident and the therapist was creative and was really up for experimenting and working with different um, ways, working differently, they really appreciated that and, and all five of them re were really appreciative of the flexibility um i think what worked for them it, it i think remote worked for all of them but in different ways um and i don't think any of them when, when we asked them you know, would you would, if, if you had your time again would you say no and they went, absolutely no we'd always say yes because it's it's worked for us but it works to it for us to a certain degree um, and on that spectrum. So it works on for, for um, Hannah right to the end and for Tom, he stays kind of um, in, in a safety area. Although Tom has said that actually one of the things after our conversation, didn't he, Anna, I really do need to sort this concentration thing out, actually. This is something that I probably do need to deal with and um, potentially this is a good way of, of dealing with it. So we did have a, we had an interesting sort of uh, round up, didn't we, with that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I definitely agree with what you said. It's definitely the therapist's confidence and their demonstration. None of the patients, I do want to say, said that it was superior to face-to-face. -to -face. So they wouldn't say that, you know, they would not have a face-to-face -face session over a moat. But what, as Chris said, is definitely about them saying that it wasn't worse. It was the same. It was in a different way and it, when it's used well when it's done well it can be really good and easy hmm. I, I think the other thing that all of them said was that remote really worked to support their goals yeah. um, they all were really comfortable that they had achieved their goals um, and they were really um, happy to have ex have the experience of remote um, and I think all of them um, are where they want to be which I think is amazing Definitely. If you could wave a magic wand, well, then it got really interesting. So the first thing that they would like is they would like to wish for, for all of us in the NHS to have really good broadband connections and to have it upgraded. So the wish was, please, can you all have your um, broadband upgraded and can you have all the equipment that you want and need? Because for all of them, I think the frustration was that um, we didn't necessarily have have as good a broadband as they did and uh, so that that was an interesting one the other thing that they waved a magic wand and said they wanted to change was in some cases they wanted people who didn't have um kit to be able to give and be given kit because they were saying you know this is so dependent on what a person's got whether they've got um, a computer or they've got an ipad or they've got uh, broadband and, and their wish all of them was wave a magic wand and actually make it possible for everybody to be able to use it because their view I think overall was you can use it in an appropriate way with everybody it's just what how much along that sort of spectrum um, the person wants to go um, and what you're really working with um, so that they all were saying absolutely um, they just believed that um, with time with care and with patience everybody could even if it was simply a phone call could work um, with uh, remote yeah and I think a lot of experienced therapists especially in the community will go into someone's house with a rough plan of what they're going to do but a lot of their um, ideas for the session would come during the session so there's a bit of flexibility as to what you can do and I think one of the things that really came up for me was that yes with conversations you can have you can be quite free with them. Um, but when it comes to the physical rehabilitation, the actually having a plan and the backup plan 
um, and good Wi-Fi and backup data <laughs> is um, the way of making it better for, for all involved. Okay, so we'll just go to the, we'll start just giving you a summary because I know there will be probably lots of questions and things that people want to, to um, yeah. raise. So we'll just go quickly flip, flip to the next slide. Um, so, um, as we've said, um, this is how we, we've just put them on, a, on this continuum. Um, and uh, so we've said, you know, we've got Meryl at, at the bottom where she's really her most comfortable is with follow-up chats on the phone. She, she will move to demos, um, but it's a lot more difficult for her to do things together, although she, um, she, I'm sure she'll move to that at some point. Um, so this is the sort of continuum. And as you can see at the, at the far end, um, both Hannah, um, Laura and um, Tony are really up for also um, having some sort of groups, which was really interesting that they, they really felt there was a place for um, virtual groups and virtual communities. And they felt that um, there, there was a the potential that uh, for uh, Hannah, she's not necessarily going to join it, but she does see the importance of it uh, because what she likes to do is she's very self um, reference as so she likes to work on her own but she's very supportive of groups and thinks um, and has got lots and lots of ideas about how patients can be involved in all sorts of exciting things um, to develop uh, remote rehab. Okay so the characteristics of people who respond well to tele-rehab um, we've summarized it with attitude background and circumstances so for us, the attitude is the positive mindset that it's going to work. And we've talked about that before, that it comes from, from the therapist, but that also they're up for trying new things, that they're very um, prepared to experiment and to have a go. Because what we all, we all know from remote is that it's very much down to the patient. So there's so much more that the patient is going to be um, doing independently, that they've got to be up for that and they've got to want to do that. Um, so the attitude um, is, is really important. Background is you know, what experience have they got already? Although, as we've learned, um, background doesn't always mean that they can do it. Um, they may have got background and experience in technology, but it doesn't necessarily mean to say that that's uh, going to be something they're going to want to do. And the circumstances for us is, is the um, environment and what's going on around them. Um, to embrace tele-rehab, everyone believes in its value and its effectiveness. That came across really clearly, didn't it? Every one of them said, you've all got to buy into this and you've got to buy into um, it being as good as. And I think that was what something Tony talked about really clearly was um, it's not a, it's not a, oh, you know, we'll do this because we can't do that. But this is something that's that's adding real and lasting value. And it's important that everybody believes in it. Um, they wanted it to be made easy. That came across, I can embrace uh, tele-rehabilitation as long as it's easy for me. And as long as you, as the therapist, make it easy for me. Um, it's also about the fact that the experiences that you're creating for me match my needs and match the way I like to work. Um, and I think there's something here also about being inspired and excited by opportunities, those independent opportunities that remote rehabilitation can provide. Um, I have the support I need, that came across really clearly. And I think Meryl was very clear about what that was, not she? She's saying, you know, there's no way she could have done it if she had had a husband. There was absolutely no way that she could have truly embraced it. Um, and the other thing that is, is, is this real sense that it works for me, it's gonna work for me, it's gonna make the difference that I need, which kind of goes back to that believing in its values and effectiveness. Family needs, big need to understand my role, what am I expected to do? How am I expected to do it? Will you help me? Will you be there for me? Um, and there was also some really interesting uh, comments from the guys about how important it was to spend time really helping the family to understand the value um, of remote and really understanding the benefits um, and, and getting their buy-in. There's also this, how will it work for me and how will it work generally? Um, and how will it, and, and there is, and absolutely there is a question, and will it be as good? Because there is obviously so much out there about, you know, physiotherapy is hands-on. So if, I, if, if I'm not, my, my family member's not having somebody who's putting their hands on my, my family member, then will it be as good and will it be okay? 
Um, and so that's a really big question that, that family members really wanted to ask, and, and all of the guys really reiterated that, didn't they? How right. important that was. Okay, and evaluation. Well, I think this was really funny because we asked them, didn't we? You know, how would you evaluate the experience? And they said, well, I actually, by the time they get to the end, and by the time they've achieved their goals, how they've achieved their goals is kind of irrelevant. Um, because what they're interested in is, did I achieve my goals and did I get the things that I wanted out of it? And if I did, then it was a good experience for me. Um, and they forget all of the times that the you know, internet went down or anything happened. It was because I achieved the goals that I set out to achieve. They evaluate it also around the relationship. These guys told us that they were really, they evaluate the experience around how they have experienced their therapist relationship. Was it easy? And the overriding thing that came up from all of them was actually, this is really good because it fits around my life and um, it can happen when I want it to happen rather than me necessarily having to wait when the therapist arrives. You know, this, it, it just, it's just more flexible. I think that's a whistle stop tour, isn't it, Liana? I think we've gone. <laughs> yeah. So it's uh, 10 to, so Caro, we'd love if you could um, be question master, please. Hello, I'm back. Hello. <laughs> so, well, actually, we've only got one question at the moment. So Ooh. I was wondering if, if the attendees could perhaps put their thinking caps on. <laughs> and, uh, but maybe you covered everything so brilliantly. Um, but there's a question from Robert, and there was a little bit of mix up first because I thought he couldn't see the screen, but it was about the Zoom fatigue. And he was saying, is there an issue with the screen size? And I sort of thought he couldn't see the slides. And then he, said, <laughs> he was, I am referring to the patients. <laughs> is there a connection between their fatigue or inability to concentrate and the size of the screen? they are using for the Zoom link, et cetera? Um, I'll, I'll take that one. I, I, I think there is and there isn't. Um, so I think for some people um, with visual challenges, um, I think having a smaller screen can be quite difficult for them. Um, but I think more than that, the Zoom fatigue tends to be um, around uh, just people. So there's a number of things. One that we, as our, you know, um, as people, we're used to being with other people and taking cues um, and clues from other people. So when we're on, um, we're using video, there we've got that delay. So I'm, I'm always looking at the screen and so concentrating so much harder to try and interpret the clues that I just get, I just get tired because it's, it's quite a strain to do that. I think for some people, the light, and um, I know that um, there's lots of people are, are now really using sort of the blue glasses so that they're not getting the, the blue light, which can be, um, can, can have an impact on people's concentration and also can give them headaches. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to, we've got a little, um, a sort of summary document. So if you, um, those of you who are interested, if you sign up for our, our Wednesday um, roundup, I'll attach the document which just goes into a little bit more detail about Zoom fatigue and some of the tips and hints that you can use to help patients um, not experience so much of it. And, and I think actually Robert was also mentioning about um, auditory and as well as the visual and cognitive problems as well. Yeah. Liana, have... do you want to take that one? Um, I just wanted to say one thing as well. I think with the Zoom fatigue, it's around not having the usual social breaks in communication that you would normally normally have when you're face to face with someone. So there may be time when you're writing notes or um, you go to the toilet or something like that, where you would have a break or they could have a break. And actually, it's almost like the session is intensified because you're having to maintain eye contact, but also organize all these different types of things so actually you don't have the normal breaks and it wouldn't it's not I don't know if it's not socially acceptable but just to sit there with in silence on at the end of a computer um but actually it it may help or to shorten your sessions or to um just do little like uh, a specific task rather than your full 45 minutes you may spread that over um 
a three days or you know however you want to do your your timetabling yeah and i think i think the other thing that's interesting isn't it is, is also to put to prepare the patient and just really say look you don't have to keep staring at the screen all the time because actually it's fine you know do what you would normally do in a normal conversation which is to look away to look at something else you know i'm there isn't a sort of an expectation that if i want you to stare into my eyes and i want to stare into your eyes that actually let's make it much more relaxed and let's make it much easier for both of us and you may there be times when you want to switch off the video um, you just want to listen to my voice um, or you just want to you want to share something on the screen or maybe just put a picture on the screen um, there's all sorts of things you can do just to to make it because I, I think I think as you said Leanne, you know we're so conditioned that we behave in the same way as if we're with the person rather than recognizing what we're actually doing here is we're talking to a screen mm -hmm. the person's in the ether yeah but they're not actually on that screen yeah. so you can chill out a little bit and and relax um, yeah so but I'll, I will attach a little a bit to our, our Wednesday roundup so we've got some questions now <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Joe wanted to know what platform did you use and how did you satisfy the DPIA? I don't know what the DPIA is, but I'm assuming it's something to do with guide governance or something. <laughs> if it's something else, please do write, write it in the chat. Please tell me what the DPIA is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I think there's another one which says about what platform did you use and how did you, I, I, again, with all trust you do have to go through the governance um, departments to be able to um, clear a platform for use within my organization we weren't allowed to use whatsapp so we had to wait for the attend anywhere platform and some um, trusts are using system one this is all in the uk um, so it really is important to get that cleared um, with your organization but also I think highlighting how you're going to use, so we did a lot around how we were going to use it, what we're going to use it for, how it was going to free up resources, improve our efficiency, our patient experience. Um, and then we could, we could then feed that back to our organization as well. Also, um, one, um, it's important to think about um, feeding back as well, any compliments as well as adverse incidents and for us touch wood we haven't had any adverse incidents with um remote at this present time um, there's a question from hillary it's, she said it's a similar question do you find that the patients using zoom over a mobile have a much reduced experience versus those using a tablet or a laptop especially for group work it seems to be much harder for them do you have views on this I'll, I'll take that one. I, I think it depends on their their experience because I know that for uh, um, for example for Hannah, um, she's so comfortable with using her mobile that um, she she's got so used to it that for her it, it would be a, she would she wouldn't even think about using um, a laptop. Um, whereas I think for other patients that you know their first port of call is a laptop so i think it's it's personal preference and what you're actually used to that, that governs it i think and also visually what um what you can what you can see and i think tom fed back in one of his interviews that he would have preferred to have a bigger screen yeah and it may be thinking as well if you're doing groups to spend some time showing them how to cast it to their telly if they've got a smart tv as well because again that can improve the the visual um, experience but it does depend how they learn as well if you're quite visual like I would want a bigger screen because I'm quite visual um, so yeah it's just trial and error really but being open to try so Joe's let us know it's the data protection impact oh. <laughs> again that would be through governance and all those yeah. <laughs> thank you Joe. <laughs> I've thank learned you. today <laughs> yeah. um, yeah, and, and I'll, just, I'll just add in there, Joe, I, I'm able to use things like Dropbox because I'm a private practitioner. So I have an agreement with patients or my clients where I can, we can store things. So um, I have a, a sort of a, an advantage, I think, that I can use all sorts of different uh, storage spaces. But I think as we get more au fait and as we start showing it and give, give them cases for use, um, then we can challenge those um, blockers in our organizations i think at the minute there, there needs to be a building up of 
um, what works for yourselves as well as what works for the patient. So, um, and so you can figure that out together. And Joe also mentions about uh, attend anywhere. Mm. I don't think you've mentioned that tonight, have you? Oh yeah, I, our, our team uses attend anywhere. Um, we found it pretty easy to use. It's, you send the patient the URL, they click on it, they go into a waiting room, then you both um, join the, the, the video call and it's there. And you can have groups on that platform. Um, so yeah, it is an easy platform. I think all of those providers have really tried to smooth out their um, onboarding of people so that it's a simple process. Thank you. Oh, hang on, we just have one question come in here. Uh, do you have any suggestions for having conversations with patients that are less enthusiastic about using tele <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a whole new webinar, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about it. This is a patient. This was um, uh, my husband's friend who was who was running. What needed to? Um, he's been running some courses face to face, and he was sort of, you know, um, how am I going to get to people? And I said, well, you could always use something like Zoom. And he was absolutely adamant. No way am I going down that road. So um, we've been having little phone catch ups every sort of. Um, week to just very gently sort of persuade him and and the reason that the things that have persuaded him has actually been that he wishes to have the contact and he wants it's the outcomes i think with patients are really a bit nervous it's about ensuring that actually a conversation is about what you can achieve through the technology um but i also understand that some patients just don't want to go there they just that just doesn't suit them at all oh so I think you're a bit, a bit frozen there, but I think we need to wrap it up now because it's a minute past eight. And um, just to remind everybody that uh, to pop over to our website, have a good look and um, read up, join our weekly roundup, our Wednesday weekly roundup. And uh, hopefully we'll see you in our community as well. Come and find us out. So cheerio, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.